Hi, welcome to the lesson. Today, we're going to be talking about Mikhail Bakhtin and his theory of the carnivalesque and the grotesque. All right, so today we're going to be talking about a concept known as carnival or the carnivalesque and an associated concept known as grotesque realism, both of which were around in the medieval and early modern periods in Europe. So Mikhail Bakhtin, whose dates are 1895 through 1975, was a Russian writer who was an influential literary theorist and critic in the 20th century. His main, well, he has many, many books, but the book that we're looking at is Rabelais and His World, and that was written in the 1930s, but it wasn't published until 1965 because of Stalinist repression of his work and ideas. And then his first was, his book was first translated into English in 1960. And that was the first of his works to be translated into English. So even though he wrote a little bit earlier in the century, his work didn't get read until a little bit later in the century. So he did his work at the time of new criticism and formalism when Russian formalism was happening in the 20s and 30s. But his influence on Anglo-American criticism then didn't happen until the 70s and 80s after his work became widely accessible in English. He was concerned with semiotics. In other words, how language creates meaning, coming up with a dialogic approach to communication that challenges some of what traditional semioticians had argued in the past. He was also concerned with the human psyche. And in the, in the one that we read, he was concerned with what he calls folk culture. Folk culture is working class culture, rural culture, peasant culture. So for Bakhtin, art is fundamentally communicative. Like the new critics, Bakhtin believed that form in literature is part of what communicates values and ideas. Form and message are intimately connected. That's why he writes about the form of Rabelais' work, and that is the form of carnival and the carnivalesque. If form is ideology, as Bakhtin has suggested, one of the things that he does in Rabelais and his world is to identify the ideological principles behind the form of the carnivalesque at work in medieval and Renaissance literature. Since we are looking at many medieval and early modern models of witches and vampires in this class, I thought we'd start then with this model. The idea of carnival is one of rebellion and revolution. Bakhtin argues that carnival is at its essence resistant and challenging to official authority. So medieval and early modern carnival describes certain feast days and celebrations of the peasantry or working classes or lower classes that took place across Europe throughout the medieval period and into the Renaissance or early modern period. Now these celebrations were times when everything was inverted upside down, hierarchies disappeared, the fool would be crowned king for a day, rules were suspended, bisexualism, homosexuality, pansexuality were enjoyed and explored, there was mass gluttony and drinking, it was an expression of abundance, pleasure, and materiality in the sense of the body, of connection to the body. So Bakhtin points to three main areas that we see carnivalesque expression in medieval and early modern culture. The first one is ritual spectacles, like a literal carnival, like Carnival or Mardi Gras carnivals. Anytime you have a public spectacle of some kind, it, it could potentially have a carnivalesque element. Another place that we see carnivalesque folk culture manifesting is in what Bakhtin calls comic verbal compositions. So he says parodies, both oral and written in Latin and in the vernacular. So in other words, all kinds of parodies, satire, that type of comedy, comedy itself is a little bit carnivalesque. That's one of the things that comedy does. Laughter is part of carnivalesque. And finally, through what has been called Billingsgate, in the British tradition, but what we would know as swearing or curses or oaths, naughty, dirty language, bad language, that sort of thing. So here is a picture of the first category of a spectacle or a, a, a you know an expression of carnival or a, a party atmosphere. And this is a painting that dates, as you can see, from the late 17th century. <laughs> this doesn't look like a carnival. Where are the rhymes, the fried children? I mean, fried dough. Oh, wow. How, how did you get in there? How did you get the PowerPoint, Wicked Witch of the West? I am here to curse you, my pretty. And your little students, too. Hey, leave my students alone. 
I will leave them alone if you stop telling them about carnival and the grotesque. You don't know what you're talking about, my pretty. I mean, I think I know what I'm talking about. I mean, modern carnivals are a descendant of medieval carnival, but there's more to it than literal carnival. Like I was saying, it's three things. It's like ritual spectacle, like carnivals and fairs and Mardi Gras, but it's also like parody and satire and curses and oaths. Curses, you stupid fool of a girl. Ignorant piglet. Exactly. Cursing and name calling is a manifestation of the carnivalesque spirit. Wow, you really suck the fun out of everything, don't you? Just go on to the next slide before my flying monkeys come and take you away. <laughs> Well, that's the perfect segue into the next slide. Most importantly, Carnival involved laughter, comic laughter directed at deconstructing authority and hierarchy and official life. Festive laughter, that's what he calls it. Satire has a Carnival-esque attitude, but unlike festive laughter, satire doesn't always laugh at itself. Festive laughter seeks to mock everything, including the laughter itself. Carnivalesque humor is humor that challenges, disrupts, ceases to degrade, invert, resist. How does my cackling disrupt anything exactly? Well, laughter can take something or someone down from its lofty position. If we laugh at something, it's not as powerful as it used to be. Um, laughter allows us to retain some kind of agency. Um, so a witch's cackle, like yours, <laughs> resists power and authority, specifically patriarchal authority. You get all of that from a laugh. <laughs> yes, yeah, let, let me explain. So carnival is focused on inversion, on flipping the usual order upside down. So if men are usually in power, then flip it to women being in power, flipping the hierarchy up to upside down. This is one way of resisting hierarchy. <laughs> yeah. Down with the man. Power to the people. <laughs> yes, carnival is anti-authoritarian, anti-hierarchical. Exactly. Down with the man. <laughs> Bakhtin writes, as opposed to the official feast, one might say that Carnival celebrated temporary liberation from the prevailing truth and from the established order. It marked the suspension of all hierarchical rank, privileges, norms, and prohibitions. So this is one of the painters Bakhtin mentions in the excerpt on page 27 as embodying the carnival -esque. This is Bruegel the Elder. And this depicts an a struggle between church authority and those without authority, the peasantry, as a literal battle between Lent and Carnival, or Shrove Tuesday, the last day before Lent begins on Ash Wednesday. Oh, there's too much going on in this picture. How am I supposed to see anything, you stupid girl? <laughs> I prefer my pretty to you stupid girl, but... I guess you're just embodying the carnivalist spirit of insults and curses, aren't you? Let's take a closer look at the character embodying carnival in this picture. So here we have carnival or Shrove Tuesday. Oh, he has all the best foods there, doesn't he? I see suckling pig and roast fowl and sweet cakes and drink. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. We see a representation of gluttony, of rich living with rich foods, and we also see the people surrounding Carnival dressed up in their costumes. This, this is a representation of the rich living people often did right before Lent, and that still survives in a festival like Mardi Gras in New Orleans or Carnival. On this slide is a representation of Lent. Is that lady supposed to be Lent? Why does she look like she's starving? <laughs> she does, uh, but she represents the denial of bodily pleasures, right? The opposite of carnival. This is what I was saying. The body's tainted. We have to deny it, repress it. In Lent, one of the things you're asked to do is deny your body in part by fasting or giving up some bodily pleasure. And medieval people did a lot of fasting and giving up things. I see that she has lots of little children with her. Do you think she would share them with me? 
I won't eat too many. <laughs> These are just paintings. You, I guess you could eat the paintings if you wanted to. <laughs> it's not the same. 